All right, so um, just to remind everybody, so this was um, this model problem where I was looking at a um, convecting disturbance whose amplitude stays constant, doesn't change with downstream distance, whose velocity stays constant, it's moving at a speed of UCV and it's exciting the flame. And in that limiting case, which obviously is a stretch, but it gives us a place to start from, the flame wrinkle response looks like this. Um, where you get these, where the, the, the flame wrinkling starts at zero because of attachment, but then it oscillates. And then we also had finished by saying, the, but and in fact, you know, kind of in this simple problem that we're doing here, where this, this oscillatory feature will just keep going and going and going until the flame ends, assuming that the vortex doesn't change its amplitude. But the other thing that you can see about it is, is that, um, you get this interference length scale, and remember that interference length scale arises because the vortex that's convec exciting the flame and the speed with which flames propagate wrinkles is not the same. So the more different those two speeds are, the shorter this wavelength will be. The closer those two speeds are, the um, longer this will be. And in the limit where the vortex is moving at the exact same speed, you get no interference. And so you don't, you would just, You'll, what would happen is this thing would just go up and it would reach a peak and stay constant amplitude. Um, all right, well, let's look at real data. So this is actually data that I showed you earlier. And you can now start to kind of get an idea of what's going on here. Um, so this left plot I showed you, um, you can see this thing. You can see the wrinkles dropping as you go downstream, and we'll talk a little bit about later what's going on there. But you can s clearly see this, uh, this interference pattern that's going on. Um, this plot here on the right, what seems to be happening is there's actually two things going on. In fact, I think I, maybe I have a little bit later. Let me just make sure I'm not going to say this. Nope, I don't. Okay. Um, there's actually a longer wavelength disturbance. And then, and you can imagine, just imagine you have a superposed smaller amplitude wrinkle with shorter wavelength. So in fact, what's happening in this image right here, I can tell you very confidently, there's two things going on, is that you have both a, vorte a vortex exciting the flame, but also an acoustic wave. The vortex is moving at, one, at, at its speed. The acoustic wave is moving a lot faster. And so, interestingly, these small little modulations are basically due to the acoustic wave. Because remember, the shorter, the, the, the more different the phase speed of the disturbance is from the, the wrinkle speed on the flame, the shorter the wavelength is. So the acoustic wave is moving really fast. So, so the interference is, is they're, moving, they're moving in and out of phase each, with each other much more quickly over, a, over an axial length scale. And uh, whereas the vortex is moving at pretty close, but not exactly, to the flame wrinkle speed, so that's a much longer wavelength wrinkle, and then on top of that is this. Um, so the flame, my point earlier is that not all velocity is the same for a flame, is that the flame cares about how fast it's mo that wrinkle is moving. Um, that uh, the, um, if, the, if, the, if the disturbance is moving really fast, it'll give you these shorter wavelength modulations. If it's moving slower, it'll give you these longer wavelength modulations. Um, and so just, uh, just as an aside, if you take it, the space-time coherence of disturbances is critical to this, as you might expect, right? I mean, it's like the difference between a laser and light in this room, is you just get totally different phenomenon when you have coherence. So if you actually took that exact same problem, that, that G equation, you excited it with a random velocity field with the exact same RMS, you'd get that line right there, random excitation. If you hit a flame with a single frequency, you get this type of behavior. And so this right here, this is the magnitude of flame wrinkling, by the way, as a function of downstream distance. Um, so again, not all the, f the flames care about the, how fast disturbances are moving, and they also care about the space-time coherence of the disturbances that are hitting them. Um, and, and in this case, it's exact same RMS of velocity, in this case, it's random. In this case, it's single frequency. And you get the sort of the classic monotonic growth in flame brush thickness here, whereas here you get the modulation that's going on there. Um, all right. So um, 
I've talked about how flames propagate disturbances. I've talked about where disturbances come from. I've talked about how if you've got, you, you can get interference effects which manifest themselves on the flame sheet. Now I want to talk about um, how disturbances go away. I've talked about how they're created, but I haven't talked about how they go away. And it turns out that premixed flames have some really interesting dynamics because of the fact that they propagate normal to themselves. This is actually a paper from Ed Law, Professor Law. And uh, just, just, you can just do a th simple little thought experiment. Imagine I take a flame and I wrinkle it. All right? What's going to happen? The flame's going to propagate normal to itself. So the parts that are concave propagate toward each other. The prop parts that are convex propagate away. At some point, that flame will look like that, right? Um, and so that side you know, is going that way. That side's going that way. So this, this part actually... It's not, this doesn't happen, right? You, you get, this is why you get these cusps. Premix flames for, form discontinuities and angle due to this phenomenon. Uh, it's like a shock wave. It's, it's a shock and angle. It's a discontinuity and angle. Um, and uh, that is due to flame propagation normal to itself. Um, so sometimes we call this kinematic restoration. Norbert Peters described this word. So kinematic restoration describes the fact that if you have a surface that's propagating normal to itself, it doesn't like to be wrinkled. It will always smooth itself back out. And you can just do this, just for fun, go draw an interface, draw it however you want, and then draw arrows normal to it, and then just propagate those arrows and watch. And you'll see that no matter how complicated a curve, you'll end up with a flat line if you just keep propagating it forward and forward and forward. Um, so flame, so this goes to the point that I made earlier about uh, when you look at flames, it's not flow visualization. Flames are not, premix flames are not passive scalars. They have their own dynamics. Premix flames are trying to smooth out wrinkles that are put on them. So you have velocity fluctuations creating wrinkles, flame propagation normal to itself that's smoothing wrinkles out. And so you can actually see this in, in like if you think about turbulent combustion, what's the really important ratio in turbulent combustion? U prime over SL, right? You remember that ratio? U prime over SL. So that ratio describes that competition right there. U prime describes what the flow is trying to wrinkle the flame. SL describes how the flame is trying to smooth itself back out. If U prime on SL is small, the flame can move faster than the flow. And the f Even if you have a turbulent flow, if U prime on SL is small, the flame can still be very, very uh, smooth and almost uniform. Whereas if U prime on SL is really big, in the limit as U prime on SL goes sort of to infinity, the flame starts to look like a passive scalar because SL becomes irrelevant relative to U prime and then the flame just moves with the flow. Um, you can actually see this, this video that I showed you earlier. Which I think I'm going to have to pull up again. Um, you can actually see this kinematic restoration going on. This exact same video I showed you earlier. But now, now pay attention to, these are the reactants. Look at the part of the flame that's concave to the reactants. And let's try to see if I can stop this thing. I don't know how to stop it. But anyway. Um, Am I dead? There we go. All right, thanks. Sorry. So this action also changes length scales. So if you, even if you perturb a flame with a single length scale, the concave part gets shorter in wavelength. Um, converging basically on a wavelength of, of zero length as you get a cusp, and the convex part gets longer wavelength. Um, and again, you can sort of see that, well, you cannot sort of, you can see it. If you look at the flame, this part that's convex, and you propagate it up, you'll see it actually, you can see the discontinuity and slope forming. If you look at the part that's convex, you'll see how it gets much longer and smoother in, um, in wavelength.
I also showed you this video. You can also see this going on here. If you watch these, um, these vortices, you know, they're, they're spinning that flame around, but then if you watch what the flame does to them, whoops, you're like, well, what happened to the vortex? It's not that the vortex is gone. I'll tell you, the vortex is still there. Uh, it's, 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 still, it's gotten a little weaker, but what happened was, again, just propagate the flame normal to itself, right? What's gonna happen? This is reactants right here. This, sheet, this side of the flame hits that side of the flame, it burns it out, and that's gone. Um, that's what kinematic restoration does. Um, and so that's why this thing, as you watch it go downstream, you'll see these, these wrinkles growing and then actually smoothing themselves back out. Yeah, and I just, I just have a little sketch over here just illustrating the idea that if this is reactants, um, the flame will not stay like this indefinitely, right? Because if this is reactants, this, is, this branch is propagating that way and that branch is propagating that way. And you can, if that's a distance L, after a time L divided by SL, that thing will be gone, right? You know, and, and so given enough time, that thing will look like this. And then even these two branches but this process is amplitude dependent. It's very nonlinear. So if you say, assume linear, you lose kinematic restoration. You've got a, it's a, it's a nonlinear effect. Um, and basically larger amplitude corrugations or shorter wavelength, shorter length scale corrugations get smoothed out faster. Um, yep. Here's a video that's all messed up. There it is. Um, where, remember, I don't know, I, I refer to the problem where you have the oscillatory flame holder. Oh, gosh. Um, here I have an oscillatory flame holder and flow is going left to right. And you may remember I said that, hey, if you linearize this equation, the magnitude of flame wrinkling stays constant with downstream distance. But if you include these effects, here's a calculation, you can see those wrinkles getting smoothed out as you move downstream. So just another example. So um, this is what leads to nonlinearities in flame dynamics. So let me just real quick flip back on a slide because it seems to have. I, I neglected to mention it. But if we go back to this data, I showed you earlier the red line. This is magnitude of flame wrinkling with downstream distance. Presumably, if we got data farther downstream, we might have seen multiple wrinkles. I don't know. But here we see this one wrinkle, and this is, you know, it's one of these wavelengths. But now I'm showing you this is one amplitude. This is a different amplitude. That's a third amplitude. So the, the amplitude of flame wrinkling is increasing. Excuse me, the, the, the amplitude of excitation is increasing. Um, so what I've done here, just to illustrate nonlinearity, is I've taken that plot and I've normalized it by the magnitude of forcing. So if the problem's linear, all the plots should fall on top of each other. So here is just magnitude of flame wrinkling, L prime, divided by the magnitude of velocity fluctuations as a function of downstream distance. And sure enough, they all fall on top of each other for the first, I don't know, two convective wavelengths, which tells me that these flame dynamics are linear. Uh, but then they start to diverge from each other. And notice that the order flips, in fact. So the biggest scaled amplitude is the smallest, the purple line, which is the lowest excitation amplitude, is the biggest scaled amplitude. The red, I dropped in a, a, the blue one. That one's not here. But notice the red is the shorter. So that tells you that we've got some saturation phenomenon going on, that I'm hitting the, the flame harder, but I'm not getting the same response. Um, and, and this kinematic restoration is exactly what's driving this behavior. Um, so just in order to, as a way to illustrate this again, I'm going to show you a calculation. Um, what I've done is, on the left, is a calculation where I've hit the flame with a disturbance that's moving at almost exactly the speed at which flame wrinkles convect, and so I don't get interference. So the flame angle, the magnitude of flame wrinkling just goes up and it reaches a constant, okay? 
Because remember, you, you only get interference if the magnitude of flame wrinkling is, um, not the magnitude of flame wrinkling, the speed with which the, um, the vortex exciting the flame is different from the speed with which the flame is convecting. And because I want to illustrate um, these nonlinear effects, I don't want these interference effects to, to, to contaminate the image. And so I'm going to get rid of those. So no interference is going on here. Um, so here I'm hitting the flame with a disturbance, and then here's three different amplitudes. This is the linearized solution. If I, if I hit it harder, I get more amplitude. If I hit it harder, I get more amplitude. But now if I take that same G equation and I turn on the nonlinearities, I get the following. Um, it goes up, but then it starts to, to roll off. And, in, and, and again, the reason why I didn't want interference is because interference also causes it to go up and down. I didn't want that to mess with it. But no interference, and it still is rolling off, and that's kinematic restoration. And if I hit it harder, it rolls off faster. And if I hit it even harder, it rolls off even faster. And so, um, and you know, this looks very similar. And there I, I just took away the linearized solution. So the left is a calculation. And the right is that data, and you know they start to. You can kind of see them starting to to look like each other. Um, so let me jump over this. Um, trying to decide how much I want to dive into some of these other details. So, but bottom line, let me. So let me just summarize before we um, just quickly hit. My, the last topic for the class, which is that if we think about how flames respond to disturbances, just a couple observations. One is when we have anchored flames, we talked about flame stabilization yesterday, you know, premix flames have this cool way of, of stabilizing themselves so they can establish a sort of a quasi steady position, even at a velocity that's much faster than them. And the way they do that is they find a stabilization location and then they spread at an angle into the reactants. Um, and both of those things are really important if we want to understand how flames respond to disturbances then, because we've talked about, first, the role of flame stabilization. That flame stabilization affects not just what's happening at the flame at that position, but also when we disturb the flame, they control how it's, how it's responding at that point and then, and then whether and the extent to which waves get convected downstream. We also have talked about how that flow that's moving along the flame is convecting disturbances downstream. And so premix flames are inherently non-local. Um, and so, again, I'll just for those of you working in turbulent combustion, you know, there's a different canonical burners out there. Sometimes people take Bunsen flames and they hit it with turbulence. And some do expanding spherical bombs and they hit them with experimental, with, with, uh, with turbulence. Fundamentally different problems. Um, because in expanding spherical bomb, there is no tangential flame flow normal to the flame. And so wrinkles are not getting transported along that surface by the mean flow. Whereas in an anchored Bunsen flame, um, everything upstream of a given point is being affected by, excuse me, everything downstream, no, I'm not saying this right, everything at a given point is affected by the entire space-time history of the disturbance field upstream. And so it boggles my mind how, in this community, you've got people trying to compare data from expanding spherical bombs and premixed Bunsen flames. Totally different drivers, you know? Um, totally different dynamics in terms of how those things respond. So tangent flow tangential to the flame moves wrinkles around. They change how it responds to disturbances. Really, really important. Um, all right, um, anyone have any questions for me? All right, I'm going to jump ahead now. I've got a lot of other stuff in here. Um, let's just say that I, I have some analysis of non premix flames that I'm going to blitz through. And lots of similarities between premix and non premix flames in terms of, of their space time dynamics. The key difference is, is that premix flames propagate, and so the speed with which wrinkles move along the flame is a little bit different than in non premix flames because non premix flames don't propagate. In non premix flames, wrinkles move along the flame at the flow speed. In premix flames, wrinkles move along the, the flame at the um, vector superposition of the flow speed 
and the flame speed normal to itself. So that's, that's the big difference. Um, okay, so that's just what all these slides say. I, I wouldn't want to leave you, though, without a little bit of discussion about global heat release response as well. Um, so we've talked about space-time dynamics, how the flame flaps and wrinkles around and what its position is, but we haven't talked about heat release. Um, in particular, and, and in many problems, what's really of interest is what is the fluctuations in heat release that are generated by the flame, as well as what is the um, spatially integrated heat release, all right? So in other words, you've got heat release all along the flame, but uh, particularly when you want to think about how flames excite acoustic waves, it's not so much what's happening locally that matters, it's the spatial integral. So in other words, like if, you, like if you're taking chemiluminescence images from a flame, you just want to know what's the total fluctuating heat release that's given off by that flame that matters. And so, um, again, I'm just gonna, gonna blitz through a lot of this stuff, um, and I'm just gonna tell you kind of a couple, a couple answers. So what you can do is, I've already, shown you how you can take the G equation, you can calculate how a flame responds to velocity disturbances. We did that model problem. And I gave you, I showed you some solutions for the fluctuating flame position, the fluctuating flame slope. I can take those same solutions and I can calculate the fluctuating heat release, uh, which is proportional to flame surface area for a premix flame. And I can also integrate over the whole flame and I can calculate sort of the, the what we'd call the heat release transfer function, which is, What's the fluctuating spatially integrated heat release of this flame as a response to a velocity disturbance? Okay, so just a couple just inter additional mathematical steps, but nothing, nothing conceptually different. Just take those solutions for flame flapping, calculate fluctuating flame area, integrate that, and you can get Q prime. And you get plots that are like, that are like this. So this is what we would call a premix flame, and this is the gain of the transfer function. So in other words, it's the, it's the sensitivity between a velocity disturbance and the heat release disturbance. So the magnitude is on the uh, x-axis, and then the y-axis, excuse me, the, the magnitude's on the y-axis. The x-axis is the Struhall number, and I mentioned this before, but turns out the, 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 nor, the natural way to normalize frequency for, for both premix and non-premix flames is through a Struhall number, which is frequency times flame length divided by flow velocity. All right, that's, that's what matters. And uh, exact same result on the left and right, just the left is uh, semi-log and the y is log. And, um, and in this case, what I'm doing is I'm exciting the flame with bulk flow ex excitation. So it's not a convecting vortex, it's just the whole flow is just oscillating in bulk. And so just a couple observations that I wanna make for you about the sensitivity. Is notice that for low Struhall numbers, the gain is one, all right? And so what does that mean? That means if I have a bulk flow, and, and by the way, this turns out this result's true even if it's not bulk, but it's pretty generically true. What that means is that if the velocity is, is 2% of the mean, the heat release fluctuation is gonna be 2% of the mean. That's all that means. And, and it's actually pretty intuitive. You can understand this pretty phenomenologically because if the velocity into a flame is oscillating, that means the mass flow rate of reactants is oscillating. And so if the mass flow is oscillating at 2% around its, you know, that means the reactant flow rate is oscillating by 2%, the heat release is going to oscillate by 2%. That's, that's what a, a, a gain of one means. Um, just means that the flame is tracking, the flame is consuming and tracking whatever you're throwing at it. If you're throwing more mass flow rate at it, it's going to give you more heat release. Less mass flow, it'll give you less heat release. That's what that transfer function one means. The other thing that you can see about it is the flame has this has a low pass filter characteristic. It's, when the Struhall number is on the order of one, it starts to roll off. So, and so that sort of, the Struhall number of less than one and greater than one sort of divides um, flames that are essentially quasi steady and not quasi steady. And that it actually rolls off, you can see that purple line is basically one on Struhall number, or one on F. So flames have a basically, and, and you could kind of anticipate that, um, well actually I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the last thing you can see is that there are local maxima and minima around that, um, that modulation, right? So maxima, minima, maxima, minima. 
And what's happening here is where it's zero, it's not that the flame's not responding. It's just that part of the flame has one phase and the other part of the flame has another phase and they're canceling. So, so the first cancellation point right here is where the first half of the flame is oscillating with a phase that's exactly out of phase with the second half of the flame. And so there's Q prime of the first half, there's Q prime of the second half, but you add them up because they're 180 degrees, you get zero. And then this, so that's when it's half, that's when it's a third, that's when it's a fourth, that's when it's a fifth, or, or whatever. Uh, no, that's not right. A third won't get you to zero. That'd be what, a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, et cetera. Sometimes when you try to do math on the fly, you mess up. Um, but anyway, that's what's going on. So there's, there's cancellation and interference going on in terms of heat release gains as well, as well, as well. So let me just explain, let's talk, the last thing I wanna leave with you is why does the flame behave as one on Struhall number? Why, why is it rolling off? Um, so uh, if we go back to that, sort of some of those model problems that I gave you, if you just excite a flame with bulk flow disturbances, that's the equation that tells you the magnitude of flame flapping. So again, this is the same as L prime, just my nomenclature changes a little bit. Um, and you'll see this one on F. So, okay, so you, you disturb a flame with a given amplitude of velocity, just the, the magnitude of flame flapping actually goes as one on F. So is, maybe that's what's going on here. Um, because remember, Struhall number is just, just frequency. Um, so you do get this low pass filter characteristic. But the flame position is not the same as, as the flame heat release or flame area. So we actually have to calculate the flame area, which has, is proportional to the derivative of the flame position. So when you linearize that thing, the flame surface area, you actually lose that, one, that low pass filter characteristic. So the flame position goes as one on F. The fluctuations in local flame area actually is flat with frequency. And that's because what's happening is as the frequency is going up, the amplitude is shrinking, but the slope is increasing and they're compensating. So you're getting the same area. So this is not why we're getting one on F. Um, Rather, the reason that the heat release has one on F is because of convection. Again, tangential convection of flame wrinkles drives this problem. And just to illustrate this point, let me, again, I'm gonna throw a model problem at you. Imagine I have a wrinkle of, imagine the flame area it has constant amplitude. Uh, it doesn't change with frequency, but it's a traveling wave moving along the flame as cosine omega t minus x on u. And I want to, so that's my magnitude of flame area as a function of space and time, but I'm calculating the integral, so I'm going to integrate that from zero to LF, and I get this thing over on the right. So that's, that, that's the integral. And notice that you get a one on omega out of there. Um, that, uh, so the, um, this one on omega or this one on Struhall number comes from the combination, so let me just flip back here. Why do, why do flames behave as low-pass filters? Why do you get one on F? This comes from the combination of two factors, that you have wrinkles on the flame that are convecting, and then you're integrating over these. And so what's happening, basically, is, is you're getting cancellation. So even though locally the, the magnitude of fluctuations of heat release aren't changing with frequency, as you start integrating over the whole flame, you get this, this low-pass filter characteristic. So this is just one more example of why um, this, this non-local feature of premix flames, the fact that premix flames can vect wrinkles, it also completely drives this, um, their, their high frequency behavior, how they respond to higher frequency disturbances and why you get this one on frequency type of sensitivity. Um, and similarly, I haven't talked about phase, but this is also why uh, if you, you know, I showed you a gain but the phase similarly rolls off with frequency for, for similar reasons. Um, now, one, one uh, let's see, one more thing, I, I just wanna make one more point before I leave all of you. And that's this. So if you can just jump ahead. Um, I've talked about how premixed flames, and I, now I want to just say a few words about premixed flames and non premixed flames. So uh, 
the plot on the right is a um, calculation of that flame transfer function. It's the gain. It looks a little bit different because I've, I've let the flame speed be sensitive to curvature. So there's, that's, that's what weak flame stretch means. But similar idea. You, just, you, you lose the nodes, but you see the gain starts at 1, rolls off as 1 and f, and then it, then it keeps going. Um, in a premix flame, the, the dominant source of heat release fluctuations, why are premix flames, why does the heat release oscillate if you have a flow disturbance? It's because a flow disturbance causes the flame area to oscillate. It wrinkles the flame. It changes the flame position. And the reason, the way I'm showing you that is here is the overall heat release is the dark line. You can't even see the line that's area. But then there's also another contribution due to the fact that the, I've allowed the flame speed to oscillate a little bit. That's due to stretch sensitivity. If the flame had no stretch, stretch sensitivity, it'd be 100% due to area. But premix flames give you heat release oscillations because the flame position, the area, moves around, and you get area oscillations. OK, now, you're going to have to take my word for it because I haven't shown you the calculations. But you can do the same analysis for non-premix flames. And I told you earlier that the space-time dynamics of non-premix flames and premix flames is actually pretty similar, uh, with the, just the one big difference is that non-premix flames move wrinkles at a, a slightly different speed. But what non-premix flames and premix flames are completely different in terms of their the sensitivity of the heat release to those velocity disturbances. So even though they might wrinkle, and they, the, they, if you set them side by side, the magnitude of flapping and wrinkling would look very similar. If you calculated the spatially integrated heat release, completely different drivers. And the way I'm showing you that is, is, is right here on the, on the left plot. So in a non-premix flame, remember, how does a non-premix flame work? You have gradients in fuel and oxidizer that are diffusing into the flame surface. And so the mass flux of fuel and oxidizer, the rate at which fuel and oxidizer are, are, are diffusing into the flame is driving the rate of heat release in a non-premix flame. So in essence, the heat release rate of a non-premix flame is proportional to the area of the non-premix flame surface and the rate at which stuff is diffusing into that area. Whereas remember, for a premix flame, the, the heat release is proportional to flame speed times the flame area. And the flame speed's a given, right? Uh, premix flames propagate at a speed of SL. It's, it's defined. Whereas the burning rate of a non-premix flame is proportional to the gradients in fuel and oxidizer concentration. If the gradients are weak, not much stuff's diffusing in. If gradients are strong, lots of stuff's diffusing in really fast. Um, whereas premix flames, they're just moving at SL. That's how fast they're. That's, you know, the, the consumption rate of reactants in a, of a Premix flame is just rho times SL, you know, consumption rate per, per unit area. Non-premix flame consumption rate per unit area is proportional to gradients in fuel and oxidizer concentration. And so you have these two effects. You have area and consumption rate or heat release per unit area. In a premix flame, it's all area. Velocity fluctuations change the area, changes the heat release. In a non-premix flame, it turns out it's all burning rate per unit area that drives it. And, and so what I've done here is I've shown you a plot that shows you the mass. So again, heat release. And what I've done is I've decomposed the heat release into a contribution from basically heat release per unit area, and the, which is, is, is modulating in a non-premix flame, and, um, uh, how, and a contribution due to the fact that the area of the non-premix flame is also modulating. And notice now that it's totally flipped. The non-premix flame is what's driving fluctuations in heat release? It's the fact that these velocity os oscillations change fuel and oxidizer gradients, which changes diffusion rates into the flame. So totally different drivers of, um, of, of the two. And so that has, um, um, I'm just going to jump over these things. Uh, yeah, so that, that has some pretty. Um, pretty profound influences, particularly in terms of where the heat release is occurring. So in a premix flame, again, heat release is proportional to heat release per unit area times area. And the heat release per unit area is just rho times SL. So the heat release rate is pretty uniformly distributed along premix flames. So near the base, you're getting heat release. Halfway up the flame, you're getting heat release. 
tip of the flame, you're getting heat release. But heat release per unit area, it's rho times SL everywhere. And as long as SL is not changing too much, um, it, the heat release per unit area is not going to change too much. non premix flame, you're getting the majority of the heat release in the first, I don't know, quarter of the flame. Why is that? It's because if you think about it in a non premix flame, a non premix flame divides fuel and oxidizer. And so the biggest gradients are right near the base of the flame, right? Because you have pure fuel, pure oxidizer, and the gradient is essentially infinite initially. So you get enormous burning rates right at the, the base of a non premix flame. Lots of the heat release is coming from that position. And then as you're moving up, you know, the fuel and the oxidizer, you know, you start getting diffusion of combustion products. And as you move farther and farther downstream, those gradients get weaker and weaker. And so the gradients in fuel, gradients in oxidizer get weaker. And so the burning rate per unit area of a non premix flame gets a lot weaker. So if you actually plot heat release, and this is, this is a, I, I jumped over this plot earlier, but if you plot heat release per unit area of a non premix flame, it starts really high and then it essentially drops to zero and it gets almost zero at the tip of a non premix flame just because the gradients are just so weak. And so what that, what that also means is in a premix flame, really the whole flame is contributing to the overall flame response, the overall integrated flame response. Whereas in a non-premix flame, it's really only what's happening right near the base of the flame that's contributing. And so, um, and for those of you who've, who study non-premix flames, you know, the base of a non-premix flame can be pretty complicated because usually you get a little bit of extinction. Those gradients, remember I said that they're infinite? Well, the non premix flame can't burn at infinite rate, so it actually extinguishes right at the base. You know, usually a non premix flame will lift just a little bit, so you get a little bit of premixing. And so the, the response of the non premix flame becomes enormously sensitive to what's happening right at the, the base of the flame because that's where the gradients are so big and that's where most of the burning is happening. Um, so let me just wrap up here. So, just kind of to close my comments here for um, flame dynamics is that. Flames exhibit wave-like non-local behavior, and that's due to the fact that there's tangential flow along the flame. So my, my, just my advice for you is turbulent bombs are really cool. They're nice, you know, and, and if you're studying an internal combustion engine where that's describing what's happening, that's fine. But don't try to conceptualize behavior where you don't have tangential flow to, flow to flames with tangential flow. Fundamentally different behavior. Equations are different. The equations have totally different mathematical properties. You can't correlate between the two. Um, the other thing is, is that because you do get this wave-like and non-local behavior and wrinkle convection, and when you start exciting flames with space-time coherent things, is that you get maxima and minima in your gain curves. You get interference. You get the one on frequency behavior and transfer functions that those things I, um, I talked about. Um, the second bullet, premixed flames are controlled by different processes in different regions. What I'm going at here is, remember how we talked about for the first half of some of those premixed flames, they were basically linear. I could collapse the amplitudes. Downstream, they were nonlinear. So the role of kinematic, kinematic restoration is, is, a, is an effect that just kind of adds up on itself. It gets more and more important as you go downstream. And so controlling physics in one part of a premixed flame can be really, really different in another part of the flame when you want to think about how they're responding. And then lastly, um, premixed and non-premixed flames have pretty similar space-time dynamics in terms of how the flame is flapping and wrinkling, but very, very different dynamics in terms of the heat release or, or the, the sensitivity of the heat release. So with that, I think just, you know, I, I hope I've, I've, I know I've sort of totally hit you with the fire hose and I've had to skip over a lot of stuff because there, we, we, this is two days instead of three days. But just lot, I hope this has given you just got feel for there's lots of really interesting problems here that are associated with, um, you know, at the intersection of fluid mechanics, instabilities of flows. I, you know, I talked about how swirl flows are, can sort of, they're like Moses parting the waters and how flames interact with swirl, interact with heat release, and you get all this really interesting stuff that if you just took those problems apart and studied them separately, you just wouldn't get. Um, I didn't have time to talk about differential diffusion. Somebody was asking me a question about this earlier, but you know, the fact that the flame speed can be such a strong function of curvature in, hi in, in high stretch flames, that's hydrogen, by the way. Hydrogen's fascinating fuel for so many reasons, but one of the reasons is, is it's very, very stretch sensitive. If you put it in a, f in a flow with a gradient and velocity, if you curve it, 
the flame speed can change by a factor of 10. Um, and that makes tur hydrogen, turbulent hydrogen flames a completely different animal than any other turbulent flame. Really interesting topic, lots going on in the literature, a lot of people studying that problem right now. Um, you know, how flames respond to harmonic disturbances. So there's a lot of really interesting problems. I, I just wish you all the best. Look forward to, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me, you know, as you're, you know, wherever you end up. So that's all I had.